Okay, let's turn the page again to chapter 10. Uh, the events and circumstances of the last few 10 billion years, which started it all. Um, it's, it's really exciting to me to have, have a chance to sit down face to face with someone who really understands these things. Um, I would like to start with the question of fundamentalism. Um, you know, for, for me, the early universe is fascinating, not only because of the great mystery of the Big Bang, but just because that's where everything started. Uh, and basically everything that we are now dates back to fundamental somethings. So the, the, the question of what is most fundamental is an obviously interesting one. And from reading your works, I, I really pick up on your emphasis that it's not even particles that are fundamental, it's fields. Um, and you give a really fascinating discussion about how you can sort of derive particles as um, modes of fields vibrating. So for a person like me, who's relatively new to quantum field theory, uh, the obvious question is, what is a field? I, I don't know if there's an obvious answer to that, but I mean, we, this is like one of those words that we use all the time as if we're supposed to know what it means. But is there anything that you can say to an ordinary person to help understand what exactly the electromagnetic field or the gravitational field is? Yeah, I think it's actually not that hard, to be honest. You know, when you walk around the surface of the Earth with a compass, and the compass needle moves in different directions, depending on how you're orienting yourself and where you are, that's because the compass is trying to point itself along the direction of the magnetic field. The magnetic field is a fundamental object that fills all of space. At every point in space, there's a little arrow with both a direction and a length. And that arrow is the magnetic field at that point in space. So in some sense, it's the opposite of a particle. A particle has a location. It's here and not anywhere else. Whereas a field is located everywhere. But at every point in space, that field has a value. It could be uh, in, the, in this room that I'm in right now, there's a field called the temperature of the air at every point, right? If I took a thermometer and put it at different points, maybe it's going to be almost the same, but there could be slight deviations in temperature from place to place. We've seen maps of the temperature of a country or of the earth, right? And that's mapping out the temperature field. The temperature field is not fundamental, right. unlike the electric field or the magnetic field, but it's still a number at every point in space. And the Difficult thing is not what a field is or what that's supposed to mean, but the fact that when the field starts vibrating and you apply the rules of quantum mechanics to it, those fields start looking like particles. So when we talk about electrons or neutrinos or photons or gravitons, these are the quantized vibrations of these fields that make up reality. So it, would it be okay to visualize a field the way I see it drawn on, on a physics textbook with sort of lines, that, that, they almost look like webs of lines that just kind of extend through space. Well, sometimes fields come in different forms. So some fields are literally just a number at every point in space. Other fields like the electric field or the magnetic field are a vector at every point in space. So a little arrow with a direction and a magnet. That still raises so the question of a vector of, of of what? <laughs> it's just, of magnetic field. That's what it is. <laughs> so this right. is something that you just have to learn yeah. to do as a physicist, that you mm -hmm. can't reduce these new mm -hmm. fundamental categories to previously known categories because they're more right. fundamental than them. You can't say a field of what? It's a, mm. it's a magnetic field. That's what mm. it is. We can talk about its mathematical description. We can talk about how charged particles respond to the magnetic field. We can explain why the compass aligns itself in the magnetic field. But mm. what it is, is the magnetic field. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it almost seems like whoever said we're all made out of mathematics kind of had it right. It just... It just seems like the whole universe is made out of ideas and 
and concepts and numbers. <laughs> that, that well, is most it's, fundamental. it's made of fields. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, again, you can't expect the fundamental description of reality to make immediate yeah. intuitive sense. Right, that would right. be crazy. Our immediate yeah. intuitive experience of the world is very far removed from the mm -hmm. scales of time and energy and length that we perceive by doing complicated physics experiments. So it's no surprise at all that our best physical theories invoke concepts that are not part of our everyday vocabulary. Yeah, that's true. And I, I think at this level of reality, it becomes so difficult for us to understand it that that's probably why it becomes difficult for us to, to believe it. Um, let's, and, and that kind of leads into the topic of the Big Bang uh, because very obviously the, the aspect of the Big Bang that really is most troublesome to our understanding is the concept that it was something from nothing. That's the argument that you always hear. You, well, you can't get something from nothing. Uh, but maybe we're, we're limited by our language when we use words like nothing and something. Uh, was there ever really nothing? And is today's something truly more than empty space or just different? Well, I think that you're absolutely right that our language is completely failing us when it comes to these questions. And again, it should. Like, what right does our everyday language mm -hmm. have to have anything to do with what happened at the beginning of the universe? So one way in which it's failing is, even before, sorry, even before we get to language failing, physics is failing us too. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happened at the Big Bang. We don't know if the Big Bang was the beginning of the universe right. or not. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. We have different theoretical conceptions of what it could have been, but it might have been. So in other words, there might be nothing before the Big Bang, but then our language gets in the way. When one person says there wasn't anything before the Big Bang, another person says, oh, so what you're saying is the universe came out of nothing. But that's not right, <laughs> because that's giving a temporal description came out of mm -hmm. to some sort of transition from nothing to something, which is just not appropriate. When you're nothing, there isn't any nothing. There isn't any evolution of nothing into something. There isn't any dynamics of nothing. Like none of those things make any sense at all. What you really mean is if you go backwards from the present day to the Big Bang, you will get earlier and earlier and earlier in time, and you will reach a point where there isn't any earlier moment. Just like if you're on like a line segment between zero and one, and you're sitting at 0.5, and you go less and less and less, so you go to 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.001, you will reach a point for which there is no earlier number. That's not to say that the numbers came out of nothing or anything like that. It's just you've reached the boundary. Hmm. Right. Uh, classically speaking, uh, there, there are three pillars of evidence for, for the Big Bang. Uh, the expansion of the universe, the cosmic background radiation, and the proportion of light elements in the universe. Um, there, there's another uh, issue that... I guess I wonder if this is a fourth pillar of evidence of the Big Bang, and that is particle identicality. And, and what I mean by that is, like, let, let's just say electrons. Every electron in the universe, as far as we know, is identical. And when you've been studying the evolution of almost anything, languages, organisms, ideas, when you see identicality or, or similarities, it reminds you of a common origin. So for me, when I see like all electrons in the universe are identical, all up quarks in the universe are identical, to me that strongly suggests that they have a common origin, especially for those particles that are conserved uh, in, in everyday life. I, I've, I guess I've just never seen this bandied about before. Uh, d does this argument make any sense or is, is, there, is there a legitimate counter argument against that? Like saying, well, of course all, all electrons are identical because because of the fine constants fine structure constant or whatever you know some some fundamental properties of space time and fields what are your thoughts about that well i think it's it's okay to say that uh, all electrons are identical because of a common origin but it's not an origin in time 
the electrons don't necessarily start at the same moment of time. You can create and destroy electrons. You can bring them into existence. The reason why all electrons are the same is well known in modern physics. It's mm. because they're all vibrations of the electron field. It's the electron field that exists and always has existed and always will exist. And when you poke it and look at its vibrations, those vibrations have certain physical properties, which we identify as an electron. And the same thing happens for up quarks or neutrinos or whatever. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. Um, at least two of your books, From Eternity to Here and Something Deeply Hidden, discuss entropy and the arrow of time at, at quite great lengths. Um, I guess before we dive further into this topic, uh, it's entropy is something that's not uh, familiar and or easy to a lot of people. So I, I, I'd like to, um, I, I would like to hear in your own words, uh, what we mean uh, when we talk about increasing entropy in the universe in the arrow of time? It's a very good question because entropy is a slippery notion. And roughly speaking, it relies on the distinction between a microscopic description of the system, like in terms of atoms and molecules, and a macroscopic description, like you know, a cup of coffee or a cup of water with an ice cube or air in the room or whatever. And the point is, at the macroscopic level, there's only certain things we can see about a system. Just like we said for the table that I'm sitting in front of right now, we see the table, but we don't see all the atoms, right? And so you can ask for any given macroscopic description of a system, like cream and a cup of coffee or this table in front of me, how many ways are there to arrange the microscopic constituents that would look the same to us, that would be macroscopically indistinguishable? And that number is, roughly speaking, the entropy. Entropy is a number of ways that you can rearrange the constituents of a system, keeping it macroscopically unchanged in some way. And so when you have, for example, cream and coffee, there's certain configurations where like the cream and coffee are separate from each other. And there are some ways you can rearrange the atoms and the molecules. But as long as you keep all the cream molecules with each other and all the coffee molecules with each other, that's fine. It looks macroscopically unchanged. And there's a certain number of ways to do that. But then when you mix up all the cream and coffee together, the number of rearrangements of the fundamental molecules is much, much larger that would leave the system looking macroscopically unchanged. Now there's a lot more room for you to rearrange all of those atoms and molecules, keeping it macroscopically the same. So the entropy has gone up. And this is something we observe all the time. If you take cream and coffee and mix them together, you can mix them. That's very easy. You can't unmix them. You can't just put your spoon in there and magically separate the cream from the coffee. That's much harder to do. And we explain that following Ludwig Boltzmann in the 19th century by saying that there are just more ways to be high entropy than to be low entropy, because that's literally what entropy is. It's a way of counting the number of ways that the system can look a certain way. And when we say there are more ways to be high entropy than to be low entropy, it doesn't sound as dramatic as it really should. There are usually many, 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 many more ways of being high entropy than being low entropy. And our universe, for whatever reason, started in a configuration that was very, very low in entropy. And it's a very big system. Therefore, it's taken 10 billion years for the entropy to increase to its current value, and it's nowhere near the maximum. It's going to take another 10 to the 100 years before the entropy of the universe is really close to its maximum. Okay. And uh, how is this related to, uh, to time and the direction that time flows? Well, the fact that the entropy used to be low and has been increasing, that's a fact that has a built-in direction of time to it, right? Entropy increases from the past to the future. That's a, that's a statement about the directionality of time. The important thing is, it's the only statement about the directionality of time that exists at the level of the laws of physics. Newton's laws that we talked about in that clockwork universe, they do not have a direction of time. They treat the past and future identically. And the same thing goes true for Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism, for Einstein's equation of general relativity, for Schrodinger's equation of quantum mechanics. As far as we know, all of the fundamental laws of physics that we've ever imagined treat the past and future the same. But the universe doesn't. 
we human beings can remember the past. We cannot remember the future and so on. And so we attribute all of the manifestations of the directionality of time in our lives, such as the fact that you can mix cream into coffee but not unmix them, to the fact that the entropy of the universe used to be small. That's the one physical fact that gives time a direction. If, if, if the entropy of the early universe had been very large, um, does that basically, would that basically imply that nothing interesting would happen? <laughs> yeah, pretty okay. much. Just like the cream is already mixed into the coffee. Uh -huh. Let it sit there in front of you and watch and, what happens. Yeah, and if that were the case, <laughs> would, would, we, would time even, ha even have a meaningful definition? Sure, just like space has a meaningful definition, even though there's no arrow of space. But there wouldn't be an arrow of time. There wouldn't be progress. There wouldn't be evolution. There wouldn't be consciousness or memory or any of those things, because all of those things rely on the arrow of time. Uh, and then you, you raised uh, a, a mystery uh, about why or how, if you like, the early universe was so low in entropy. Um, and I sort of thought of three possibilities, and, and you did address one of them uh, in From Eternity to Here, and, and, and that is simply the, the small geometric size of the early universe. And, and uh, you, you sort of related this to uh, quantum wave functions having sort of a limited number of possibilities, but you also addressed the holographic principle, which says that the entropy of a region of space is kind of bounded or proportional to its area. So is, is there, I, I guess I'll bounce three of these ideas off of you. The first one is, is there maybe some merit to this idea that the early universe had really low entropy just because it was tiny? No, there's no merit to that idea whatsoever. Oh, okay. <laughs> because it could have been much, much higher in entropy, even though it was tiny. That's something we understand oh, very well. I see. So, so when you say low entropy, you, you might, I, I, basically, I think you mean relative to what it could have been. Well, it could have been anything because the size of the early universe is part of its physical configuration. Mm -hmm. The fact that it was small is part of its physical configuration, but the fact that within that small size, it was very smooth mm. is what makes it low entropy. Okay. Um, the, the second thought I had about that was uh, radiation. Um, I, I never really understood that radiation had entropy until I read your books. But you, you described it as, as essentially being proportional to the number of photons, which in a way kind of comes down to being proportional to the wavelength of a photon. Uh, because mm -hmm. a, a, high, uh, a, a low wavelength photon can be absorbed and then re-emitted as several longer wavelength photons. So I, I, I guess this just made me wonder if perhaps the, the early universe was dominated by, by a relatively small number of very small wavelength photons and would, would that not kind of give it an inherently low entropy? Well, the early universe was close to thermal equilibrium as far as the photons are concerned. So in other words, there was a temperature that where the photons were interacting with the electrons and positrons and protons and neutrons and so forth, and everything was pretty close to thermal equilibrium, except for the fact that the universe was expanding. So if you turned off gravity, if there's no such thing as gravity, in the early universe, then the early universe would have had high entropy because it was already in thermal equilibrium. That's what we mm. recognize to be a high entropy state. Mm -hmm. But exactly because it was so dense and small, gravity is exactly not turn offable. You cannot ignore it. It's the most important thing. And gravity doesn't want to smooth everything out. Gravity mm -hmm. wants to pull things together. So when you ask about wavelengths of photons and so forth, it depends on what other things you're holding fixed. You can take mm. any number of photons, like you said, and increase their entropy by turning them into more photons with lower energies. Mm -hmm. But there are constraints in the early universe from the fact that these photons keep bumping into electrons and other things. If you did that, mm. those lower energy photons would just be absorbed by electrons and converted back to high entropy, to high wavelength ones. So, sorry, to high energy ones, so that you yeah. got back to the same number of photons. It's really the gravitational mm -hmm. configuration of matter that is telling you that it's low entropy. Okay, great, because that was my third idea. <laughs> um, I, I was also surprised when I read your books, I'm, I'm sure many people are, that gravitational binding tends to increase entropy. 
Uh, black holes, for example, have the maximum entropy that you can pack into a space of that volume. Uh, and when I read that, I was reminded of uh, a lecture that I watched by Alan Guth when he described inflation as a, uh, a, a, an anti, a repulsive gravity event uh, where space sort of expanded exponentially because gravity was, was repulsive in that epoch. Uh, and that made me wonder if maybe this sort of anti-gravity can have sort of an entropy lowering effect, just like gravitational binding has an entropy increasing effect. So the answer is no, because nothing has an entropy lowering effect. Entropy uh. goes up. That's what it does, according to the second law of thermodynamics. But the interplay of gravity and entropy is very subtle. It's just not going to yeah. be simple. You know, again, the, we never promised you a rose garden. There's no very simple connection. It depends on what is doing the gravitating. When you have ordinary stuff, particles and fields, planets and stars and galaxies, then it is a true statement that things condense gravitationally and increase in entropy. All you have to do, if you ever want to know what is the direction of higher entropy, just visualize the system and what it will actually do. It will evolve toward higher entropy. That's what things do. So if you have a bunch of gas and dust in the universe acting under the force of gravity, they will clump together. Therefore, you know that a clumpy distribution has a higher entropy than a smooth distribution. But if you have what is called false vacuum energy or dark energy, that smooths things out and pushes the universe apart. Therefore, you know that it must be higher entropy when it's smoothed out and pushed apart if the universe is dominated by false vacuum energy. Right. Uh, my, my final substantive question is about the, that topic of magic willpower that I raised earlier. And another fascinating concept that I'd never heard of before I read your books is crossing the symmetry. Um, and, th and this basically has to do with how we might be able to discover particles or fields uh, that are unknown to us and, and that we, we, we might be tempted to attribute to magic willpower, ESP or telekinesis or whatever. Um, uh, if you can give me a minute or two and sort of uh, elaborate on, on that issue and how, how we've actually been able to use uh, natural world particles uh, and fields to, to sort of probe or disprove the existence of magical ones. Sure. You know, it's, I, I wouldn't in this particular context refer to magical ones because this, this idea that I'm talking about only refers to physical objects. Like, obviously, if you just violate the laws of physics, you can do whatever you want, right? I can't prove <laughs> that there isn't magic or non-natural things going on in the world. What I can prove is, if the stuff obeys the laws of physics as we currently understand it, then we can put very good constraints on what can and cannot exist. And crossing symmetry plays a big role there. It's just the following idea. You know, imagine a process between particles. For example, an electron and a positron. A positron is an anti-electron, right? An electron and a positron can come together and annihilate. They spit out two photons. So there's a conversion where two elect an electron and a positron come in, two photons go out. And you can imagine drawing a little picture. This is what Richard Feynman did with his Feynman diagrams. He drew a picture going from left to right of an electron and a positron coming in. They annihilate, two photons go out. Crossing symmetry just says you can calculate the strength of that interaction. You can calculate, in other words, how likely it is that an interaction like that will happen if you bring the electron and positron nearby each other. And then you can rotate the diagram. So if you have an electron and positron coming in to make two photons, you can rotate the diagram by 180 degrees so that two photons come in and make an electron and a positron. And crossing symmetry says that is an equally likely interaction under the right circumstances. The strength of that interaction is equally big. You can even rotate the diagram, the original one, 
90 degrees. So that instead of an electron and a positron coming in and creating two photons, an electron and a photon come in and interact and scatter off of each other. So out goes an electron and a photon, okay? So that's a completely conceptually different thing. At first you were talking about the annihilation of two particles into two other particles. Now you're talking about the scattering of an electron and a, and a photon off of each other. But crossing symmetry says those also are equally strong, equally likely. That's what that symmetry is. So the point of this is that if in our bodies or our brains, we have particles, right? Even if you think we have other things as well, you know that we have particles. We have electrons in our brains. We have atoms in our brains, okay? So if you were to imagine some other kind of force or field or particle that somehow affected the motion of our electrons and atoms in our brains, then that's basically a scattering experiment, right? That's a, an experiment where you have the electron in your brain, it bumps into this other new particle or field and that changes its behavior somehow. And crossing symmetry implies that if that were possible, if such a thing were real, some other field or particle that was bumping into our electrons and affecting them, then you could rotate the diagram into one where an electron and a positron came together to create this new particle, just like they created the photons in the first place. And that's something that particle physicists have done all the time. We've smashed particles together. We've looked to see what comes out. And we know we have the complete list of what comes out if you smash the particles together with lower than a certain energy, certainly way, way higher than the energy that's in your brains. And yeah. we haven't seen anything. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is, as long as the rules of quantum field theory are being obeyed, we have the complete inventory of what is going on in your brain and how it is interacting with other stuff in your brain. That's not to say you cannot violate the laws of physics by invoking magic. I'm just saying that the magic has to be of a completely different kind than we have in the known laws of physics. Right. Uh, so I, I guess my takeaway from that is if, if there is magic willpower, it, it's not operating through any particles or fields that, that, that we would uh, be able to That's detect correct. at all. Yes. Yeah. This has been a fascinating conversation, Professor Carroll. I thank you once again.